Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, we are again assembled after tea break for a third plenary session. And uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Professor Sanjeev Rastogiji, uh, who is uh, um, now professor in Lucknow University. Before this, he was in Delhi as a director of uh, RAV, Rasti Ayurved. Vidya Pit, that is Ayurvedic Academy, one of the prestigious institute of Ministry of Ayush. He was director there. Now he's again in Lucknow, uh, Uttar Pradesh, as a professor in Lucknow University. Uh, it is my privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Sanjeev Rastogi. Uh, the organizer has rightly given him a suitable uh, a title, that is Education, Practice and Research in Ayurveda. Uh, evolutionary development and future challenges. This is his title, and I. Uh, there will be uh, 45 minutes uh, time for your presentation. Sir. After that, we will have 15 minutes uh, discussion. If any one from a audience have a question for you, I will try to those uh, address those uh, answer. I welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Sanjeev Rastogi. Let us welcome him with a uh, huge round of applause. Please welcome <laughs> Dr. Rastogi. Very good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Gurmeet, for a kind introduction. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, before I start my talk, I just wanted to share you two informations. Mm, the first information is this, that this, this talk, Education, Practice, and Research in Ayurveda, which has been given to me to talk about evolution, development, and challenges, it's quite a comprehensive topic. And I suppose that in 45 minutes, possibly one cannot cover it. It is such a big, 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 big thing or big topic to deal with. So what I have tried to do, I just have tried to identify the, the major challenges, major trends, in fact, which have been occurring during last many, many hundred years of the development of Ayurveda. So we will be focusing upon certain kind of things which are really crucial. Second thing is this, that I would be a little critical at certain places. I, 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 with due apologies to Dr. Rahman is here in front of me. And I expect that Dr. Katoch might also be here or, uh, okay. So I am, I supposed to be critical and I am little critical because being critical gives you an opportunity to learn from the mistakes which you have made and gives an, you an opportunity to, to find out the ways how to meet out those kind of things, those kind of mistakes to, to, to make out from the mistakes and to learn to make yourself better. And why I'm going to share this kind of thing with you people? Because I suppose I see, not only suppose, I see that the Tibetan people or the Tibetan medicine people are following the track which is being adopted by other traditional system of medicines. I mean, what is happening there in Ayurveda, these are our younger brothers and they are, they are coming in the league. They are also queuing up in the same line. So my humble request is not to follow those mistakes which we already have committed. In last past 50 years of the, of, of the independence, we have made a lot of mistakes, and this is the reason uh, Dr. Rahman might be agreeing with, that we really, uh, we really have made a I mean, lot of mistakes. So Tibetan medicine people are requested not to follow those kind of mistakes. I would be highlighting a few of those kind of things. Okay, to begin with, this is the healthcare matrix. We understand healthcare is totally dependent upon the education practice and research, and the net healthcare delivery is completely dependent upon the education practice and research. These three cannot be considered in isolation, but they have a very, very close association. And this is, this is a kind of reciprocal uh, relationship between these three. Education has to do something with research. Research has to do something with the practice. And again, practice has to do something with the, with, with the education. So this all has to supplement. This knowledge is in, in all these three spheres, which has to be supplemented in all these domains. This is we, where, when we look at the, how, how the evolution of the, the health sciences started, there are three kind of approaches of the historical evolution of the health sciences. One is the inclusive approach. What is this inclusive approach? 
Inclusive approach is the versatility of the roles related to the healthcare. We see when you, you look at the history, you see that when the history of medicine started, when it began initially, it was one person who was playing all the roles. I mean, the one person who uh, he was playing the role of educator, he was playing the role of researcher, he was playing the role of physician, he was playing the role of a spiritual leader. At the same time, it was the one person, it was the same person who was playing the versatile roles. So it was the single person who was playing all the roles and this the same kind of thing, same kind of approach was being adopted by the modern medicine as well as uh, uh, by the traditional system of medicine. What happened recently? Recently we have evolved. I mean, we say that we are scientifically more evolved now. So what we have started doing, we have identified the roles of everyone. Each one is having a separate role to play. And therefore what we have done, physicians are separate, researchers are separate, educators are separate, teachers are separate. So we have identified different faculties where a lot many different kind of people with specified roles are involved. This, this has done good also. But unfortunately, this has done bad also. What bad it did, it, have, it has developed a kind of isolated development of different streams, which we are not really linked together. So it was the development in isolation. And during this kind of process, what, what we really have observed that we have lost a kind of interconnectedness. I mean, somebody who is doing research has nothing to do with the practice. Somebody who is practicing has nothing to do with the research. Somebody who is teaching has nothing to do with the research. So these things, although they might be doing wonders in their respective fields, they have nothing to do with the other streams. But what we have observed earlier is that research, education, and practice, these three things are, go, are required to go hand in hand. You cannot isolate them. You cannot keep them separate. You cannot keep research separate. You cannot keep practice separate. And you cannot keep education separate. So these three things are to be together, to be, to be, to be considered together at the same time. So very recently we have observed that no, this exclusive kind of development which we were making was not really good. So again, we need to look back at the inclusive approach. And this is the reason Dr. Rahman might be agreeing that again, because of this reason, we have started practicing the Vaidya scientist approach or the physician scientist approach. Now recently we have started doing that the physician at the same time has to be a scientist also or the Vaidya in Ayurveda has to be a scientist also because unless he is having that kind of incl inclination, he cannot do the research. And without involving the practicing people in the research, you cannot really make a kind of translational research which is, which is really very much required. Ayurveda, let us start talking about what Ayurveda is. Ayurveda primarily being told that it is a kind of eternal system of knowledge. What, what this is, eternal system of knowledge? Why, why it is being called eternal? Eternal is not because it is, being, it, 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 it is having a kind of divine origin. No, it is not because of that reason that Ayurveda is being, being hailed from the mouth of the Brahma. No, it is because a lot of principles which are there in Ayurveda for example, it is being told that it is anaditvat. It is not having a formal, formal origin. You cannot point it out that, okay, this particular time Ayurveda originated. No. Nobody knows that from where Ayurveda originated. So from where Ayurveda originated, it is largely what we see is that it is a sort of observational science. And it is not uh, someone has done it. It is, it is being done, it is being developed in hundreds and thousands of years by means of continuous observations of lot many people, millions of people who were observing what is happening in nature, what is the healing potential of the nature, what is the disease causing potential of the nature. And by means of this continual, continuous observation, continuous accumulation of the knowledge, this science developed. So we cannot point it out that at this historical point of time, Ayurveda started. So we say that it is, it is anadi, it is not having any formal beginning. Uh, uh, further to this, it is being told that it is Sobhav Sansid the Lakshana. It is, it is well proven. Its fundamentals are self-explanatory through the observations and explanations and applications. If you look at this, this is a very simple funda, uh, dictum of Ayurveda. This Sarvadasar Bhavanam Samanyam Vridhikaranam. It's a very, very simple fundamental of Ayurveda that the similar thing increases the similarity and this similar thing decreases the similarity. It's quite simple to observe that yes, these things are really happening in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the life. And moreover, 
Its meaning and nature, nature of Ayurveda, are universally true. What we talk, we, what we consider true here in India might be true everywhere in the world. It is not limited to India. This knowledge is not Indian knowledge. It may be universally applicable and it is beyond the time limit also. It is not true that what is true now may not be true after two, 2,000 years. No, it has to be true because it is, it is a sort of fundamental knowledge. So because of these three fundamentals, it is being considered that it is sort of eternal knowledge. And it is not that it is being hailed from, from the mouth of Brahma. Unfortunately, to make it understandable, because for the common people, if we say, if we explain the things like this, that Ayurveda is eternal, possibly the people may not understand. So what Ayurveda has done, Ayurveda has adopted a mythological descent of Ayurveda to explain it that it might be having a sort of, it is having a sort of eternal knowledge. Because for the common people, a word which is coming from the mouth of the God possibly is having more value comparing to the word which is coming from the mouth of a human being. So for that reason, Ayurveda just have projected in that way that it is hailing from the mouth of the Brahma. So it is being told that Ayurvedic knowledge, initially it was in the divine position, then gradually it came to in, in the sagic position, and then it came to the human position. And because, because now we see that it is having a divine position, we can say that it is having a sort of eternal eternity. How the learning started in Ayurveda? Learning again, Ayurveda, in, in, in Ayurveda, learning was of two ways. Initial learning was intuitive learning. There were no systematic, organ, uh, systematic knowledge which was available. It was intuitive. Intuitive means I am observing the nature and I am learning from the nature. A lot of curing, I mean, a continuous, and, a continuous and curious observation of nature's healing and disease causing property were be, being observed by people. And this knowledge was transferred to the next and next generation by means of oral trans, tra transfers, oral traditions. When this knowledge got accumulated too much, I mean, um, over a period of time, a lot of knowledge got com uh, compiled, accumulated, and then it was realized that possibly oral transition may not really work for this. So for that reason, it was required that a sort of systematic presentation or systematic knowledge transfer might be required for the next generations. So for that reason, Ayurveda uh, was established as a distinct discipline of a study and career. This was the earliest mode of systematic learning in Ayurveda, in India, which was available. This is the Vedic time of, uh, Vedic kind of learning, which we, we call Gurukul mode of learning, early later Vedic period, that is 1500 to 500 BC. What were the peculiarities of this kind of learning? This was a very, very special learning which was early uh, available in, in India in reference to Ayurveda. See, these are the peculiarities which are available with this Gurukul. It was a fully residential teaching and training program conducted away from home at ashram, focused learning inclined at early age. It started at very early age and course completion on the discretion of the guru. I mean, it was guru. It was not a fixed tenure training program, but it was the guru who was deciding that whether this, this student is perfect or not by means of taking certain kind of examination. And it doesn't matter. It takes five years or 10 years or 15 years until or unless you are perfect. Unless, until or unless you are perfect in the eyes of your guru, you won't be eliminated. You won't be getting out from the school. So this was the peculiarity of that kind of knowledge transfer which was available earlier. Practice combined with education. This is also some uh, a wonderful thing which was available earlier. The practice was truly because the teachers who were there in the Gurukul system were the physicians themselves. They were the teachers, they were the researchers, they were the practitioners. So students were also getting all these opportunities. They were teach, uh, see, uh, looking at the patients, they were finding the medicines from the wild, they were making the preparations and they were learning also at the same time. Interactive method of learning, this was also something wonderful which was associated with Ayurveda during that time. Interactive means there were plenty of opportunities to interact with the teachers. And you would be surprised to know that most of Ayurvedic texts are in the form of the question and answer. It is the uh, student who is asking a question and teacher starts explaining those questions and by means of that he is dealing about the, the subjects. So it is, it is completely interactive and a lot of interactive opportunities were there and throughout the history of Ayurveda. Learning the fundamentals by adopting them in life, this is also something wonderful. Being in ashram, you were not really allowed to, 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 to make your life as comfortable as you might be making in the family. So you have to abide by the disciplines of the ashrama. 
So you were having, or the students were having an opportunity to learn, literally learn what is there in, in, the, in, the, in the lifestyle of Ayurveda. So they were having an opportunity to learn the fundamentals by adopting them in their life. Applying individual skills to solve the clinic, clinical riddles because they were having this opportunity to deal with the patients. And formally, um, finally, this uniform teaching irrespective of the class or social standards of the dis disciple. This is also something wonderful which was associated with Gurukul. In Gurukul, a student was not being known by the caste or by means of his family, like from where, from which family he belongs. All those who are there in ashram are equal, are at the equal status. And a beautiful story in India is being told about uh, Krishna and Sudama. This is one beautiful example that how, what, what kind of parity was there among all the students who were receiving the education at the ashram. This symposium and assembly were also wonderful ways of expanding knowledge or delivering, I mean, delivering knowledge or giving knowledge to the students. This, this is being told in Ayurveda, Vaidya Samuhu Nishansai Karanam. I mean, it's assembly of the Vaidyas or assembly of the seers or assembly of the knowledge, knowledge aid people gives a sort of uh, general agreement on the complex issue. It gives you a knowledge to, to learn on the complex issues. Tadvid Sambhasha, Tadvid Sambhasha means those who are having equal and competent knowledge in the same field. That is Tadvid, those are the peers. That means a discussion among the peers expands the horizon of the wisdom, it expands your wisdom, and finally, Acharya Shastra Digam Hetunam, that, that means a sort of uh, uh, knowledge person is the, the authentic person who can give you the knowledge in particular subject or particular field. Professional etiquettes are also something which are to be adorable, which were there in practice of Ayurveda earlier. Recognition and respect of all having a specialized skill and knowledge, it was there. And beautifully, Ayurveda explains that knowledge of medicine can be adopted. Not only the physician or teacher can give you the knowledge about the medicine or the drug, but those people who are, who are living in wild, I mean tribal people, tri tribal people or those shepherds and the, the, the cow owners, those who are rearing the, 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 the animals in the wild, they also can give you a lot of knowledge because they live in the vicinity of the nature. They live with the nature, they might be knowing that this herb is good for this, condi this condition, this herb is good for this condition. So Ayurveda recommends that knowledge should be taken from them also. So it, 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 is, it is having a kind of professional respect for those all people who are having knowledge in any particular dimension of the, of the field. Respecting the opinion of others despite of differences, this is also something wonderful which is there in Ayurveda. Doesn't matter what kind of opinion you have, you are having a knowledge in that particular field and our responsibility is to respect your opinion also. This is also a wonderful professional etiquette which is being recommended in Ayurveda, which, which was there in practice, not recommended, it was there in practice. And at the same time Ayurveda says that seeking the opinion of others in area of others expertise. A beautiful example are there in the two disciplines. There is one, one is the surgical discipline and another is the medical discipline and Charak very clearly specifies that this disease doesn't come in the purview of the medicine. So for this particular disease, the person has to go to a surgeon to get the proper opinion because this disease doesn't come under the purview of a physician. So the proper opinion has to be taken from somebody else who is expertise, who is having an expertise in some other kind of field and who might be more able to, to give a cure to that particular kind of condition. This is also something very, very important which has to be understood that what, what was the quality driven ed education during the earlier times. I mean, you would really be surprised to see that Ayurvedic, uh, Ayurvedic education in earlier times was really a kind of quality driven education. And this quality driven education was being brought about by right education for right students by right teachers. Ayurveda emphasizes a lot that what should be the education and how, what, what should be the, uh, the, 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 the components of the right education, who should be the right student and who should be the right teacher. And they have a sp a specified specific qualities of the students, specific qualities of the teachers and specific qualities of the subjects which are to be adopted by the students for the purpose of a study. And Ayurveda is possibly the only system of medicine or only system of education, uh, only, on, only subject of education in earlier times where a cross-evaluation technique for quality-driven education was adopted. What this cross-evaluation technique was? 
the students were supposed to evaluate the teachers and teachers were supposed to evaluate the students i mean the final judgment that you are a good teacher you you yourself are not going to label yourself that you are a good teacher your student are going to say that you are a good teacher and similarly teacher is going to judge the student so this was a kind of cross evaluation and this was wonderfully explained in ayurveda during the earlier times uh, then then finally after this uh, gurukul based education the, uh, there was a sort of university based education in ancient and medieval india a lot of universities were there in earlier times we have lot of historical references to them and a lot of good ayurvedic physicians have been produced from these universities now look at the current i mean this was what was happening earlier in ancient time in medieval time of india in regarding to the ayurvedic education what is happening now characteristic of the Ayur uh, current ayurvedic education see this is the uniform teaching and training program throughout the country this is regulated by mandatory norms enacted through various bills and acts uh, this is uh, having education dis disbursement disbursement is through identified in institutions which are following certain norms that is msr minimum standard requirement for graduate and post graduate courses and this is a time bound and syllabus based program which is being offered throughout the country now and uh, apart from that there is a kind of compulsory internship program which is associated with all these programs and there are certain regulating authorities which are regulating this education syllabus infrastructure and teaching is regulated by the ccim examinations are regulated by the universities providing affiliation to the colleges and human resources are recruited by the state or central authority like public service commission or union public service commission or the ministries like that so this is the regulation infrastructure look at the infrastructure what we have in ayurveda in india currently this is first april 2016 data which is available on the site of the ministry of ayush we have 279 ug colleges 50 over 15000 bms seats 112 pg colleges 3029 md and ms seats hospitals 2836 number of 40 over 40000 beds dispensaries registered practitioner for 4 lakh 19000 registered practitioners this much of the pharmacies and paramedical colleges we do not know because no data is available and how many seats of paramedical are available we do not know current programs look at the current programs how what kind of programs are being offered so there are two kind of programs which are being offered in india one is the conventional program and another is the non conventional program conventional programs are those which are being operated by universities or organizations lot of these programs basic courses bms specialty courses ms and md and phd intermediate courses uh, the crav and mrb courses diplomas interdisciplinary courses hospital management administration health management public health yoga and paramedical courses these are the regular courses which are being offered by universities or by organizations various non conventional courses or programs are also being offered for the people these number of such programs online courses distant learning programs short term training programs hand on training programs knowledge based or non knowledge enhancing programs professional skill improvisation lot many such programs are available current ayurvedic education current education is standards in ayurveda do you feel that all is well do you feel that really what is happening that 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 is really fine i'm sorry to say that this is not all is not really well why why all is not really well let us look at the deficits let, let let us look at the problems there are qualitative deficits and there are quantitative deficits look at the quantitative deficits disproportionate distribution of teaching institution if you look at the whole map of the country you are going to see that most of ayush colleges or i talk of ayurveda colleges are concentrated over 50% colleges are concentrated in karnataka mp maharashtra and up i call them kamau states they are the kamau states karnataka maharashtra mp and up because these states are having maximum number of ayurvedic colleges and besides this other states are not having a proportional distribution of ayurvedic colleges look at the physician and population ratio ayurvedic physician there are only 31 ayurvedic physician comparing to the 1 lakh of the population and if you compare it from allopathy in allopathy there are about 60 physicians per lakh population so it's it's a, it's a kind of dis, there, there is a kind of disparity and there is almost nil representation in many areas including the northeastern states 
uh, uh, doctor might be agreeing that in northeastern states, there is a very, very poor representation of Ayurvedic colleges as well as Ayurvedic practitioners. Now, talk of the qualitative deficits. About 20% of the total registered practitioners who are there are non-institutionally qualified. We do not know what kind of qualification they might be having. They might be having a kind of WS quality, so we do not understand that what kind of knowledge they have. Huge institution-based qualitative differences are there. This is also very, very pertinent problem, very, very big problem. I mean, number of colleges are there where, where the students do not really match each other. One student, if you bring from one very high institute, would be very, very different comparing to the other, other student who is having a very poor in infrastructure, despite of the fact that all of them are going to get the same degree. They would be qualified same. They would be having the same BMS qualification. They would be having the same MD or MS qualification. But their standards are much, much different. And that difference is because of the institutional difference, because institutions are much, much different. The, the, the quality is completely diluted because number of private institutions are rushing up. A lot of, I mean, it's, it's being called as mushrooming of the institutions. In whole of the country, a lot of number of private institutions are coming up, which are not having any quality standard. So this is, this is serious, I mean, seriously diluting the, 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 the quality of the Ayurvedic education. For last many, many years, many decades, we are seeing that government institutions have not been increased. There are limited number of government institutions which are offering this MD and MS and BMS qualification in various states, and this number has not increased in past many years, despite a few which are being taken up by the Ministry of Ayush at the central government. The state governments have not really taken any initiative to start new colleges of Ayurveda anywhere in the country. Government institution, if you look at the quality of the government institution, I'm sorry to say that they are no better than the private institution. They are also running in the same way possibly, and they are also representing the very, very poor quality. It's, it's a very poor status. Uh, it's, this is also one very unfortunate thing that if you look at the treatment standards which, is, which are being offered in the institutions, the institutions who are offering the teaching in particular discipline, they are supposed to bring out the guidelines or the standard treatment for certain conditions because you are teaching the students, you are the teacher, you are, the, you, are, you are belonging to an institute and you have to bring a kind of guideline which is going to be followed by the rest of the people who are there in the, there in the country. But unfortunately, if you look at the standards which are being practiced in these institutions, this is, this is, this is pathetic, this is completely pathetic. You cannot really trust what kind of standards are being followed at these, these, these institutions. So unfortunately, they do not have any standard care. And production of graduates with qualification. This is surprising that we produce a lot of graduates with qualifications, but unfortunately without the skills. They are coming up with the qualification, with the degrees in their hand, but they are not the physicians. They look for the job, they, they, they wonder to have a job, but they do not dare to practice because they are not really skilled. They do not have that kind of knowledge which makes them a competent physician to come or to face the pa patients. And this lack of confidence brings a desire of being supported with modern medicine. I mean, this is the reason why the Ayurvedic people or all the traditional medicine, uh, traditional me medical people ask for a support or ask for an integrative kind of approach or ask for support from the modern medicine because they do not get comfortable they, they are not really confident enough for their own system of medicine. Okay, this is the growth of Ayurvedic education in past two decades, 1993 to 2016. Population growth rate this time in 2016, in India it is reported to be 1.3%. Just look at that how Ayurveda is growing, comparing to this population growth rate. What is growing below the population growth rate? Hospitals, 1.3%, dispensaries, 0.6%, registered practitioners, 0.7%, pharmacies are 0.2%. Despite of the fact that population of India is growing at the rate of 1.3% per annum, this is the growth rate. That simply says that you are not matching with the demand. You are not matching with the need of the people. People are rising, people are growing, number of people are growing, but the hospitals are not growing. The, pay, the, 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 the number of registered practitioners are not going. So that simply says that possibly you are not really able to match with the kind of demands which are being created by the people. And look at that, what is, what is, what is at par with the population growth rate? UG colleges. 
4.2%. UGC, it's 5.6%. PG colleges, 5.9%. PGC is 9.3%. This increase is much, much higher comparison and comparing to the population of India. But unfortunately, this all is growing in the private sector with a kind of WS standard. And number of beds, if you look at 2.4% increase in bed is there. I'm sorry to say that a lot of these beds are non-functional beds. I mean, these are just the numbers. Don't, don't get uh, 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 confused with this number because most of these beds are non-functional. Um, you are not really going to find the patients on those beds. Specialty education in Ayurveda. Look at what is a specialty, a specialty education. We have MD and MS in 22 subjects. About 3,500 specialists are produced in a year. And at the same time, we have PG diploma in 16 clinical subjects. And the aim and object of this uh, PG diploma is to produce efficient Ayurveda specialists in clinical specialties. This is the CCIM mandate. CCIM says that what, we, I mean, what is the aim and object of producing the MD and MS? Just have a look at this. I mean, you would really be surprised to see that what is the aim and object of producing MD and MS in Ayurveda. The aim of the postgraduate degree course shall be to provide orientation of a specialist and super speciali specialties of Ayurveda and to produce experts and specialists who can be competent and efficient teachers, physicians, surgeons, obstetricians and gynecologists, pharmaceutical experts, researchers and profound scholars in various fields of a specialization of Ayurveda. I mean, this is a wonderful object. This is a wonderful aim. If you look at that, what we are aiming at, this is wonderful. The orientation of super speciality. They do not talk of a speciality. They talk of super speciality. But what actually is happening? I mean, we produce 3,500 clinical, uh, not clinical, specialists in various fields, various disciplines. As we have told that there are 22 specialties in Ayurveda. Where these speciality, uh, specialists go? We are not really able to find them in the practice. Ayurvedic clinical specialists are not traceable at the private practice. You do not find any specialists in the private practice. You do not find them in the district hospitals and dispensaries. There are no specialists. You do not find in the Ayurveda facilities, which are co-located at allopathic hospitals. Where these all postgraduates go? It's quite simple. They simply go to the private, private colleges, which are coming up every, every now and then. A lot of private colleges are coming up. And because of the mandate of the CCIM that they require postgraduate qualified doctors as a faculty member, all of them are getting merged in the private colleges without having a practical utilization. Suppose you are a postgraduate in medicine, you are a postgraduate in Kai Chikitsa. What CCIM says, a Kai Chikitsa person can go to the forensic medicine also, can go to the uh, social and preventive medicine also. I mean, there are a lot of different kind of structures. So what happens ultimately? Ultimately, it happens that your speciality is of no use to the society. You do not really serve to your own people for what? you have received your qualification. And because you are getting a job in some, some other, somewhere else, you are a medical officer, you are a medical officer in various councils in CCRS or CCURM, where you have nothing to do with your specialty. Your job is different, you might be there in the ministry, you might be there somewhere else, and your job is nothing to do with the kind of a specialty which you had earlier. So it's, it's quite unfortunate that despite of being, I mean, a number of specialists being produced in the country, we do not really see them in the practice. And uh, for this reason, this purpose of producing ex experts remains largely defeated in current job scenario. Faculty members of the colleges, I'm sorry to say, I'm also a faculty member at a college and I'm very sorry to say that despite of the fact that they are specialists in various kind of conditions, they are not the real clinical experts. Every day in my hospital, every day we do a lot of inquiries from the patients. Lot of inquiries from the patients. Do we have a specialist for the cancer? Do we have a specialist for the arthritis? Do we have a specialist for the skin diseases, for diabetes? I mean, for so many kind of clinical conditions which are bothering the mind of the people, they are coming in Ayurveda with the hope that possibly we would be getting some kind of expert with, uh, there in that institution who is able to take care of us. And unfortunately, we do not have. There are no clear answers for that, that who is the cancer specialist in Ayurveda. At least in the colleges, we do not have. And there are no genuine replies to these all inquiries. And these are repeated inquiries which are being made at the colleges. 
So what we are producing and what we are doing, we are producing more of the generalist rather than a specialist. Because of this reason, because of this reason, what is ha ha happening in the clinical practice? Because we do not have the real clinical experts from the institution. In institution, we do not have the experts. What happens? In the private practice, lot of self-made experts are coming. Because they know that institution, there is no diabetes specialist. So what, what happens? A lot of practitioners are self-proclaimed specialists. They pretend to be or they project that they are cancer specialists, they are diabetologists and they are this and they are that. So they are trying to fill the gap, but with the dubious quality again, you do not, you cannot really trust upon their quality because they are not professionally qualified. They have not received any specific qualification in that particular specialty. So they simply claim and their claim cannot be checked that whether they are really the specialist or not. And these many number of conditions are there where specialists are available in the market. Unfortunately, colleges who are teaching the students, they do not have the experts, but in the market there are experts. In the field, if you go in the practice, you would be finding number of experts and they are claiming, they are claiming that they have cure for this and this. Through the internet or through lot of commercial, co commercial kind of propagation, they have lot of this kind of thing to say that they are having expertise in those particular kind of field. Besides this, if you look at the practice, there are also a lot of questions. This is a very recent paper which, of mine which was published recently at JAIM. This, question, this has questioned the, the, the prescription quality. I mean, what kind of prescriptions we are prescribing in the, in, 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 the, in the hospital or in the institution? For a particular kind of clinical condition, ad should, uh, there, there, there should be some kind of similarity in the prescriptions. There should be certain kind of template, there should be certain kind of norm which has to be followed by everyone. Unfortunately, this is also not being followed. So this is a poor prescription quality at teaching institutions, no standard format of prescription writing, and missing important clinical ob observations or information from Ayurvedic perspective. And because of this reason, this kind of record, this kind of prescription cannot be taken as a evidence or the document, or authentic document pertaining to the, uh, to the clinical observations. There are questions related with the rationality of the prescription also. Why you have prescribed this particular medicine? If somebody asks you, there are uh, very few who are really able to answer to reply that. And because of this reason, a, a specific trend is being observed that the people are having their specific preferences of writing the medicine. I mean, some people are preferring the rasa medicine or herbometallic preparations comparing to the herbal medicines only. Because they feel that possibly this herbometallic herbo preparation might be acting faster comparing to the herbal medicine alone. Similarly, they have, they, they, there are certain kind of inclination that the people are inclined towards the proprietary medicine. Oh, okay, fine. Proprietary medicine, because they, I mean, they, they might be having their, their own inclination or their, their own kind of interest in writing certain kind of prescription. So this is also under question. This rationality of the prescription is also under question. Overuse of proprietary drugs over the classical drugs, overuse of herbometallic preparation over the herbal alone drugs, and overuse of the panchkarma procedures. Without having a rationality of the procedure, you keep on prescribing that this panch karma should be recommended. You do not know that whether it is really going to have effect in that condition or not. So you do not think of. Research in Ayurveda, if you look at the evolutionary perspective, a highly advanced research orientation and methodology was observable in ancient Ayurveda. I would not be going into detail of that. These are the classical methods of acquiring knowledge in Ayurveda. This is something important to understand that evolutionary aspect of the uh, Ayurvedic research where what was a specific in, in, in Ayurvedic research in earlier time, it was continuous research, it was real life research, it was holistic research, it was translatable research, it was need based research, it was local resource oriented research and this research of Ayurvedic research of then was able to produce all time great healthcare knowledge compiled in Vrattai and Lagutrai. For this reason, I call it, it is not evolutionary aspect of Ayurvedic research, but this is revolutionary kind of a research which was being done in Ayurveda in earlier times. You just have a look at this Ayurvedic research then and now. This was then research in earlier time, and this is the research which is being done now. Mind the gap, what is the gap in between? A lot of gap, a lot of differences there, and mind the directions also. What, what was the direction of earlier research? and what is the direction of the current research. Contemporary research, if you try to look at the contemporary research in Ayurveda, it is again poor in quality, poor in quantity, 
and if inappropriate focus also focus the problem of focus is also I would not be going into detail this is the hierarchy of the evidences unfortunately Ayurvedic researchers do not really fit into this kind of hierarchy which is which is there at WHO standards and this is evidences in Ayurveda a lot of soaring gaps are there still still a lot of gaps are there which are required to be filled and if we do not have the rigorous evidence uh, rigorous research based evidences what is going to happen the choice of treatment benefit or non benefit are just the matter of flip of coin I mean you do not really know that it is going to happen or not you do not know for sure and it would be difficult to answer the questions related to the course of the therapy and expected outcomes it is being asked many times by the patients that what is going to be the outcome of this therapy because you do not have the evidences you do not have the reply as well and similarly patients choice of healthcare system will remain belief based and not evidence based so what are the immediate challenges to Ayurveda I see that immediate challenge is the lack of dependability you do you you are not really dependable you do not create a kind of trust among the people that yes this system is really going to take care of your problems and second problem is inability to address the immediate needs of the people we do not know that what they are needing what they really need but we we try to sell what we have to offer so this is a different kind of approach so uh, what people look from the service provider this is a rater index which is being utilized by the the, the quality people they identify that if it is a reliable this system of medicine is or this this service is reliable you need to look at that does it deliver as it promises they need to look at the assurance you need to see that does it inspires the confidence tangibility by uh, going into the Ayurvedic hospital do you have a kind of feeling that yes this hospital or this clinic is able to take care of my problems does uh, I mean do do they have those kind of tangibles which are available which need to be there in a clinic then the kind of empathy which physician offers to the patient how empathetic the patient a physician is for the patient and the responsiveness and in how much time the response can be delivered so these are the, the, the this is this this is a kind of a scale on which you can measure that what is the standard the quality which is being offered uh, by the by the system of medicine which we are offering to the patients and the steps for generating dependability the only 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 way is to percolate the knowledge percolating principle of the knowledge transfer the start with the research follow the education follow the principle practice and then again move backwardly practice to education and again from education to research so this is a kind of a reciprocal relationship I mean it's had it has to be a sort of continuous flow of knowledge from one point to another point future trends we are able to identify these kind of trends increasing demand of Ayurveda in public increasing awareness about principles of healthy living including food and routine increasing willing willingness of getting away from modern medicine and considering it at as, as a last option increasing tendency to prefer conservative management rather than ma surgical management increasing inclination of modern scientists to understand Ayurveda better increasing investment of research on in Ayurveda both in private and government sector so what we are seeing we are seeing that words seem to have all set embracing Ayurveda the people are ready to embrace Ayurveda what we need to do this is time for Ayurveda to show up its readiness for getting embraced I mean the word is ready to to get hold of you but you have to show your responsiveness thank you thank you very much thank you so much uh, dr. Sanjeev Rathogiji it was such an elaborated presentation and he covered uh, most of the aspect and what are the challenges faced by Ayurveda now and it uh, coming days it will be also implemented to Swarikpa so he has put many questions uh, for Swarikpa uh, to how can we go forward so thank you so much for your elaborated uh, presentation now uh, the forum is open for questions if any questions related to presentation of Dr. Rathoge, please. Please, please. Uh, good afternoon, sir. First, I want to clear her something. Um, you are bothering me about Swaripa entering in the Ayurvedic. This, I want to clarify. 
but uh, Ayurvedic um, composed uh, Ashtang, Ashtang composed by the Vakbata, but we respect Vakbata. Vakbata is the main source in the uh, Sauric world, so, but base man is same, but instruction different. But we have to look uh, this building, this building and outer uh, outer building was base man is same, but instruction is different. Like that same, uh, that's why don't worry. Uh, we never enter in the uh, Ayurvedic side. <laughs> this is clever high. Now uh, I want to ask some question. Right now we are going a um, lot of discuss for the medicine, but we are all future doing doctors. We are saving uh, those lives. But we are mentioned on that, but we are talking uh, like as a commercial work. We are talking all the time medicine, uh, then uh, pharmacal, like that. This uh, mention, uh, mission, mission and uh, talking is very different thing. That's where one thing, this one. Then second thing, now Ayurveda is very, very developed in Indian, Indian place, in the India. But um, outside field, on the field, right now we are looking uh, to the malaria side. Malaria, you have to think for the malaria problem. Uh, yearly, mostly million people, they are dying for the malaria cause. But we have to uh, not protect on them, not uh, able to save. But we have to issue on that. This is uh, for, uh, I think this uh, issue is better for us for the future time. Thank you. Shall I, shall I give, uh, shall I say something, Dr. Gurmeet? Yes, yes, yes. Huh? Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, uh, as I understood from your question, you were focusing on two things. One point you wanted to mention that Ayurveda or the traditional system of medicine are growing commercially possibly, and uh, possibly that should not be done. That's partially true. That, that's true also because Ayurveda is one system of medicine which is always ethics bound. I mean, it always talks of ethics. All, all, it is not only Ayurveda, all, all traditional system of medicine are ethics bound. So they talk of ethics principally, ethics first and then commercial gains, they, they follow. I mean, and, and uh, for, for that reason, uh, it is being told in Ayurveda very clearly that those people who want to, uh, to, to, to take Ayurveda for the purpose of their livelihood, they should not enter into the Ayurveda. This is not the right place for them. I mean, please, please do not come in Ayurveda if you really want to make money. So Ayurveda clearly specifies this, and I suppose that whole of the, I mean, all kind of traditional system of medicines, and this is the reason that Ayurvedic people are, look, look, where they are, I mean, they, they are the poor guys. They are the poor people, they, they are not really able to make money in that way as the modern people are making. So I agree in that way, but you have to gear up with the kind of requirements of the society also, so you have to modify your thinking in that way. Uh, second point you were mentioning about malaria, I do agree and this is what I was telling that we need to identify what are the needs of the people. Okay, that is good that a lot of things are there in Ayurveda, fundamentals and principles, that all, that all is there. But at the same time we need to look at that what is the immediate need of the people. If somebody is dying in front of me, if I do not have anything to offer to him, what is the meaning of having all the fundamentals in the mind? I mean, there is no meaning of having all the knowledge in your mind if you cannot save a person. So that is also something which is very, very important. And malaria is one very, very important kind of disease which requires, requires proper remedies. And Ayurveda can really help as it is being done in China. They have developed some RT medicine uh, uh, with, with the help of cert certain kind of herbal products. So the same can be done in Ayurveda also. We also have a lot of epidemic kind of diseases where modern medicine does not have anything to offer. For example, this Japanese encephalitis and dengue and chikungunya, a lot of people are dying every year. So we have to be responsible for these kind of situation. I do agree with you. Thank you. Sir. Uh, uh, with the permission of the chair, 
out the outset, I must congratulate Dr. Pro uh, Professor Rastogi for making such a comprehensive, nice, and critical presentation. Thank you, thank you, sir. This, I mean, of uh, course, it was crit critical, but let me tell you, you have been very honest throughout your presentation. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. And I wish if these shortcomings are being noticed by the government, sir, sir. some some uh, measures are taken sir. to improve the status of our youth system of medicine sir. in this country right now. Sir, the problem is this, that in Ayush ministry, the people are not really ready to hear this all. Not exactly. <laughs> rather, it is, it is rather, rather, it is the duty of each and every sir. Ayush personnel to take sir, it sir, seriously sir. and to do the remedy, take the sir. remedial step in this direction. Uh, Dr. Rastogi, uh, you may differ, I may differ with you as far as the, our point of concern is concerned. Views may be different. It's in the year 2001, WHO has published some guidelines for conducting the research in the field of the Ayush medicine, Sir. herbal medicine rather, not Sir. exactly. Yeah, yeah, Ayush. for herbal medicines, yes. For herbal medicine. And their basic target is they do not bother what philosophy you follow, mm -hmm. what is <coughs> your uh, thinking about the system. Mm -hmm. Your philosophy may be different, your thinking may be different, your steps may be different, your etiquettes may be different. Mm -hmm. What they are bothered about the three things. Mm -hmm. The first one is the quality of the medicine. That's true. The drug which you are going to give the patient is a pure one. That's true. It is, it is having the quality. Mm -hmm. And number two, a second important aspect is the drug is safe for the health of the patient. That's, that's quite important. That's very, very important. Right? Mm -hmm. And the third one is efficacy. Lastly, efficacy. Yeah. Because they are least bothered I mean about the efficacy since these systems are existing on this earth for the last 5,000 years uh -huh. or more than that. Uh -huh. Means efficacy is there. That's mm -hmm. why these mm -hmm. systems are surviving. Mm -hmm. So do you not think we should adopt these guidelines in our systems of medicine? It's quite obvious that we need to observe. We, we need to adopt these kind of things. I mean, there's no harm and it has to be done because when you talk of safety and efficacy, it is always being told that safety comes first. I mean, first you have to assure that what all you are going to that's do with your patient, that's, that's it is not really going to do any harm to the patient at least. Because you know, our philosophy may be different, but uh -huh. our aim is the same. That's, that's, I, 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 I completely agree with you, Dr. Raman. Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. In this regard, in this direction, yes. we should think, yes. and our research should be subjected towards the same thing. I completely agree thank with you, you Dr. Raman. So nice of you once mm. again. Thank you. My thank sincere you. congratulations. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, I'm very um, thankful to you uh, discovering uh, the weakness of the traditional medicine in this modern time. Mm -hmm. So you show all the problem, but you you know uh, what you you didn't show the solution. What mm -hmm. could be solution? For that, I need to have another lecture of 45 minutes, <laughs> I suppose. Mm. So, I, and I think that you know. Um, um, once as a doctor or physician in this modern time, and now gradually I feel like that the uh, difference between the traditional doctor and mo this is med uh, modern medicine doctor, this kind of the different shit is gradually disappearing in this day. Mm -hmm. Because modern medicine doctor also <coughs> use the <coughs> therapies, panchakrama, char sutra, also used by the modern medicine doctor also. And uh, Ayurveda doctor also prescribe the uh, modern medicine, um, allopathic medicine, Mm -hmm. So in future, uh, the problem is that uh, Ayurvedic doctor should also learn the modern medicine. So then, um, I don't know what what will uh, what will happen to the, the difference between you know uh, 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 modern medicine also should learn the uh, traditional medicine. Some uh, modern medicine in India who know the Sanskrit and Hindi, they also study the uh, Charak Sanghita, Sushrut Sanghita. So, what do you think this uh, this kind of the problem? Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for raising this important issue. And Government of India is doing a lot, in fact, in this issue because uh, India is being told uh, as one of those kind of countries where a pluralistic model of healthcare is available. Pluralistic model of healthcare says that you have got number of system of medicines which are officially recognized. 
We have IO systems where number of systems are already recognized. We have allopathic system of medicine. But unfortunately, for last qu quite, 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 quite many years, this was being observed that there was no cross relationship between these systems. I mean, they were developing and they were treating their patients in isolation. Whereas we now really realize that a lot of conditions are there where modern medicine can help. A lot of conditions are there where Ayurvedic medicine or other traditional kind of system of medicine can help. But unfortunately, because there is no cross dialogue in between, modern people do not talk to Ayurveda, Ayurvedic people do not talk to modern medicine and same as with other system of medicine. They are not really aware about the strengths and weaknesses of other systems. And moreover, what is happening that everyone claims that he is having a cure for all the things. I mean, this is also very strange. If you look at modern medicine, they also claim that they are able to cure, they, they do not need anybody else. I mean, they themselves are able to cure all the uh, problems which are arising over the earth. And the same is Ayurveda also. Ayurvedic people are not, not I mean, uh, not declining that they are not able to, uh, to cure all the medicine, uh, all, the, all the diseases. They are also claiming in the same way. But unfortunately, the people are not getting the benefits of all those, these kind of things. Neither from Ayurveda nor from modern medicine, they are not benefited. So there are certain kind of cases which Ayurveda can help. There are certain kind of cases which modern medicine can help. So unless you have a cross dialogue between, unless you have got a kind of understanding of other systems, you cannot respect them. So this kind of cross dialoguing is why it is needed. It is needed to develop a kind of mutual respect. This is very, very important. As, it, I, I, as I have told you that in Ayurveda it was there, that the mutual respect was there. If somebody is having knowledge in particular field where I do not have an expertise, I need to respect him. I need to really respect him. And if I am getting a patient where I feel that another physician might be doing good to that patient, I should be honest to refer that patient to him. So how you can learn it? You can learn it only by having a kind of knowledge of other systems also and by having a sort of open mind. So for that reason, Ayurvedic people are required to learn modern medicine. Doesn't Learning modern medicine doesn't mean that you have to practice modern medicine. Learning different language doesn't mean that you have to speak different language. It, this enables you to understand them in a better way possibly. This, this, this is the advantage of learning the other, other, other kind of things or other, other cultures, right? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Sanjeev Rastogi ji, uh, for your answers it, as well as your wonderful presentation and for audience for interacting and uh, uh, digging out more issues out of Professor Sanjeev Rastogi ji. Now, to formally thank uh, Dr. Professor Sanjeev Rastogi ji, I invite uh, from organizer's side uh, Dr. Tinlet uh, Hogawa to kindly present a moment to Dr. Professor Sanjeev Rastogi ji.